welcome to A Word with Kelly Scott Reed. We're here with David Duggins. Hi, David. Hey, how are you, Kelly? Thanks for having me on. I'm so excited to have you on. So something that you and I have in common, you have listed that you are a writer, mm -hmm. a songwriter, yeah. right? So that you have in common, but you're also an artist, which I found really interesting um that you have all you have a lot of different uh avenues that you travel down creatively mm -hmm. yeah it's a it's a blessing especially uh, during times like this when uh real life is is pretty trying <laughs> and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh it, it's a, a a good it's an escape as well as kind of a tool for you know, self-analysis and growth mm -hmm. and if you're feeling stuck <laughs> because you're mm -hmm. stuck inside during the pandemic, for instance, mm -hmm. you can you can use uh, writing or visual art to kind of express you know, whatever feelings of claustrophobia. And honestly, for me, the pandemic was not a huge change from the way I normally do things because <laughs> I'm an introvert. So I was like, "Wow, really? This is nobody's going outside, and that's wonderful." So I had the very same, I, I'm extremely extroverted, extremely. And I, I thought, <laughs> and I thought I was going to be in misery. But what I realized is I wasn't because no one else was having any fun either. <laughs> so you have camaraderie. Yeah. You have the bonding it, it, with other people who are miserable. Yeah. You know, and, but it was like, for me, it was like, just because. I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to say in. I felt it was a recharge, weirdly. I thought, I felt like it shifted a lot. It was easy. It was like really struggly during the whole time, right? You felt mm -hmm. that kind of, but it, when you come out the other, of the other side, you feel like, oh, I worked through a ton in that time. And I yeah. didn't realize it until recently that happened. And, and maybe that's something that's kind of, uh, typical of, of extroverts. It, it's not necessarily in your nature to sort of be extremely self-analytical. You you get most of your energy from out here. So that's mm -hmm. where you draw your energy from. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know that this is true, but I, I suspect that people who are strongly extroverted get a lot of their sense of self from the people around them. And that's something I've seen in, in other people I know who are extroverted that I've actually had an opportunity to talk to about that. So, yeah, it's, so, um, go ahead. You, you just, you just have a, it's just a, a, a different uh, way of gathering energy and then using it, I guess. It's Do always you think interesting. any of your introversion it helps you in in writing a little bit more in depth characters. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you observe a lot more, maybe. I hope <laughs> that's what I'm doing. <laughs> that's definitely what you want to do as a writer. You kind of want to be a, an, an observer, and I I, I practice. So I still do. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to go to like a Waffle House at some weird hour, like two in the morning, and just sit there and get you know a cup of coffee or something and watch people. And where I live, I'm really close to the Waffle House and it's right next to the train station. So you get people getting off the subway, walking over to Waffle House to get breakfast at 2 a.m. on a Friday. And, you know, it's just, it's a hoot. You get lots of interesting conversations in places like that because somehow or another, the booth gives you a false sense of privacy and you'll talk about anything. And I'm like sitting right behind you, just like taking notes, like, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how I learned to write dialogue. Have you ever written about somebody that you've witnessed, like based a character on one of the people that you've been watching? I've tried to do that before, but it always ends up being like an, an amalgam. You know, I, like I start with a, a scene or a sequence and then the characters will generally sort of take over. <laughs> Uh, and they have their own ideas about who they want to be and what they want to do. Uh, so I just kind of let that happen. It used to be really frustrating because, you know, I, I'm thinking, this is my creation. I should be able to control it. 
what is going on? The, the yeah. inmates are running the asylum, but that's actually what you want because the character <laughs> will lead you to, you know, authentic choices rather than being steered in, you know, some random direction for the plot. So it's a, so it's, tell us sorry. Go ahead. No, please go ahead. I was going to say it, it can be a difficult way to work because I do outline, but I only do that to give myself a reminder of basic structure so that I don't forget subplots because sometimes I'll do it like, oh yeah, I haven't seen that character in about 70 pages. And now I have to go back and rewrite everything up to that point. Mm -hmm. But the outline I create really is not all that helpful in sorting out story beats because so much happens in the process of writing a chapter that is completely spontaneous and I really want to preserve that because if it surprises me then hopefully it'll surprise the reader too so mm -hmm. are you working on anything right now currently I am I'm actually trying to make up my mind between like three different things <laughs> I have a, a sequel to Rome Futurum which I published back in 2018 it's I think it's going to be three books the way it is working now mm -hmm. and I started that and then I got distracted and I have two other projects and then the three of them are just sort of, it's like a three-way tug of war. Eventually one of them will take over and I'll work on that exclusively until I get done with the first draft. But for now, they're all, just, I'm juggling them. I don't know which one I'm going to do this year. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So you got some stuff now. Do you have like, a, do you, I want to phrase this right. Do you have a genre that you, is your genre different in music and in writing? And I say that because like, if your writing can be dark sometimes, maybe the music is also metal. Or if you write, like, I wonder if your genre travels with you between what you, with your, what you do. Well, I, when I'm writing alone, I do write metal. Most of the stuff that I do solo is metal, but the stuff I do with other people tends to be, well, I, I don't know. It's, rock influenced but not metal like the blues band that i mean the they it benefits from the fact that my playing style is pretty much blues based so even though i'm a metal head it's still basically like pentatonic scales and stuff and so it lends itself to you know that style of music pretty readily you just have to kind of tone the distortion down a little bit so but that was fun. I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to do that project with my friend Eric is because when we did the first album, uh, we wanted it to be really pretty clean. Like all the guitar sounds are clean and the, the production is, you know, I, I was really paying attention to that. I, mean, I want everything. I want you to be able to hear every instrument really clearly and, you know, like hear the strings on the guitar. And I worked a lot to get that to happen. And I think it did. I'm really proud of that record. I had a couple of people who produce professionally in Austin because I made the record in San Antonio who asked me what equipment I use and they were expecting me to say, you know, like a $45,000 Neve console. And I was like, <laughs> nope, that amazing. computer right there. <laughs> it's amazing what you did. Now, is this that uh, uh, Big E and the Wild Hairs? Is that yeah. the band you're talking about? Okay, yeah. cool. I'm going to uh, look that up. Yeah, it's a uh, blues rock. The second album is a little heavier than the first one. We, we actually love that. The third one's going to be even heavier. So <laughs> we're doing it backwards. Like most people, they start with the really raucous stuff and then they kind of mellow out with age. We're like, well, we started old anyway. So <laughs> we're just old and grumpy. And <laughs> that's the music. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you know what's the great thing about the blues is it can kind of age with you. <laughs> like that's true. Yeah, it's, it's, it's timeless. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the form, the twelve-bar form. It's like the perfect musical form. There, it's it it has resolution. It has change. It has everything you need. It's all in this one nice, neat little package. Yeah, it gets a little yeah. boring to some people, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, when was the first time? in your life, and there may have been many times that you realized for you that language had power. When I was in the fourth grade, uh, I started writing little, you know, 10 year old poems. <laughs> and some of the other kids in the class liked them. So I guess that was where it really started to sink in that, you know, I might be able to do something with this. I wrote a 
like a little book for my English class, which is, you know, it's like take typing paper and fold it in half. And yeah, that's, that was basically it. I don't even remember what it was now, but I do remember that my English teacher sent home a note for my parents saying, you know, this he's, there's something here. You might want to encourage this, which they did. So that, yeah, it's very helpful to have supportive parents. I wouldn't say they were super keen on me, you know, just jumping out there and becoming the great American novelist, but they did love the fact that I wrote. That's awesome. That's great to have that level of support. You know, and in, in, in beyond that, parental support, did you have any other people in your life, like friends or as you got older, people who encouraged your writing, got um, helped you with it like other authors? Or did you have influences beyond your home when you were growing up? Yeah, I, this is actually this is one of the things I wanted to make sure I, I mentioned here because I've talked to um, younger writers at conventions and things like that. And, you know, the question is always, how do you break in? You know, can you introduce me to the people who can get me where I need to be, that sort of thing. And the, uh, the popular sort of uh, way of describing that is, uh, it, it's not really about who you know, it's about your ability and there is some luck involved. When I first started, I really didn't want to believe that, but now that I've been at this for a while, I think that's definitely a factor and that is out of your control. So my way, my method for dealing with that is to ignore it. If I don't control it, then I just let it go because I can't do anything about it. So um, I, I started publishing in, in the 80s and um, I had short fiction in three of the earlier issues of a magazine called Cemetery Dance, which is um, kind of a genre staple for horror. And uh, then I had a few other sales and things were looking great, kind of started to take off. It was, this was the early nineties. Um, I had this run from 91 to 92 where I sold everything I wrote. I wrote six short stories and they all sold that year. And I was just, <laughs> I remember sitting on my couch in the living room. I was living in England because I was in the Air Force and I was stationed there and just kind of looking around going, I'm in England. I wanted to be here for 15 years. Yeah, I mean, the writing thing is happening. Is this really happening? Wow. And I was so <laughs> excited. And then, yeah. then I hear the whole thing tanked. <laughs> Which is, that's kind of what I wanted to get at here. It's like, yeah, if you're, uh, if you're looking at your career as a straight line with, you know, a goal at the end of having had so many books published or what have you, I, I feel pretty strongly that you're going to be setting yourself up for disappointment if you do that. I had kind of two things working against me when I started. One was a very narrow definition of success. Mm -hmm. which was basically I make a living by writing books and that's it which I have never actually done so but I'm still uh, a writer and creative and that's the important part exactly it's funny because I have kind of the opposite story I was always like writing and writing a little dabbling here and there but I was I'm very practical I have to have a job job do you know what I mean I'm like <laughs> I had no illusions of ever doing anything I have hmm. So when Tiffany's like talking to me at work and talking about the press and I went, yeah, I'd love to do that. There, this feels like such a huge step in a direction that I never imagined, even though it's free, we do it for free. We love it because it, it feels huge to me. <laughs> so it's just funny. You talk about like expectations and yeah, I had none. <laughs> I'm very thrilled. With oh, that's good. Yes, because it's almost as much work getting rid of the expectations and learning how to live happily as you are, as it is to learn how to do the work itself. It's, and that's something that, you know, nobody teaches you. You just have to learn it by being in the trenches. But I had an ally that I just kind of 
lucked into, as you will. Uh, one of the first editors that I sent stories to, um, she didn't accept them because she didn't feel that they were right for her magazine, but she did like the work. And she sent me like a really long personal letter with recommendations of where to send it. You know, one of the, I sent her two stories, which you're also never supposed to do. I broke so many rules and she was still <laughs> just wonderful to me. And she's like, you know, you, this one, of the, I sent her two stories. She's like, this one is kind of a pun, which I do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but as she said that this other one, this could be your, your first pro sales. It's really good. So, and then she said, you know, you're going to be working on, you're going to be writing a lot of things that are really just sort of burning off the cliches until you get to the heart of what you know, the subjects that really matter to you. And she said, that's going to happen and don't worry about it. It's just part of the process. So let it happen. And, you know, <laughs> write 15 oh. things that sound like Stephen King and, yeah. And then, then finally find your own voice. I still have all like paper copies of the first things I wrote. And oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so when you look back, when you read the things you wrote before, do you recognize yourself in it? Or does it feel like a very foreign person wrote that? Like someone a little <laughs> bit removed? Yeah, the older I get, the more it feels like that. The more I feel like I don't even know that guy. <laughs> Who was that? Which is good, right? I mean, we're supposed to change the, that's what, another thing I like about the, the art is that it, it does kind of, it's inward seeking, that's sort of its nature. So if you're truthful with yourself, you're gonna produce art that kind of pulls out that stuff that you ignore while you're doing your day job. And it has value because of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who, who influenced you when you were young? You know, you mentioned Stephen King because he's kind yeah. of the guy. He's the guy. Yeah, and, uh, he's the guy. <laughs> well, I is read there anyone else. Yeah, well, I read um, three books that came out in early '70s, right around the same time. Uh, and it was it was Thomas Tryon's The Other, um, The Exorcist, William Peter Blatty, and Carrie, Stephen King's first novel. So those were kind of my first forays into adult horror stories, except for Poe. I read Poe when I was like 11. <laughs> that changed my life. But, but so um, Stephen King, definitely. Richard Matheson, uh, all the writers who worked on the Twilight Zone series, which is Matheson, Rod Serling, a guy named Charles Lawton. And uh, do you know the Twilight Zone episode, The Howling Man? No. No, but Rod Serling is from our town. He's from Rochester. Is, is he really? <laughs> yes. That's so cool. Oh, yeah. my God. Oh, Brooks I just get really excited. <laughs> he, didn't, yeah. he was just born here. I don't think he was raised here. I think okay. his parents got him right out. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I just thought when you no, mentioned no, that's, that, I was like, oh, my God. That's really interesting. Yeah. It's a, I wonder if he did live there. And I, I read there was a... Um, I forget who wrote it now. Somebody published a book about the series and they had interviews with Serling in it. And uh, they were talking about his parents. They made a bet that they were taking a road trip cross country and they made a bet that he would not stop talking. <laughs> the minute he got in the car, that he would talk the entire way. And he did. He That's was a so born, funny. born communicator. <laughs> oh, I love that. Okay, sorry. We got off track. You're in but, That's But I those know. are your your guys yeah the, the ones who uh, who brought horror into my neighborhood that's the way i felt about it uh, especially reading matheson for the first time because his stuff is all suburban and you know it, it's very much the life that i knew so reading those then i was like well i could actually just write a story about my backyard i could do that and it's totally legit so yeah that made me feel like i could actually do it myself it's so cool. I love it. And, and do you do, I say to ask this question, I hope it's clear. Does your genre choose you or do you choose your genre? I really think it chooses you. Um, I don't remember ever consciously saying or thinking, oh, I love scary stuff. But 
my parents told me a story about something that I don't even remember myself, but when I was five years old, apparently I was begging my mom to let me watch a werewolf movie on TV, which we didn't watch much TV at all. So I don't even, <laughs> maybe I saw a preview for her or something and, oh, I wanted to watch that. And she was like, no, <laughs> you're five, <laughs> go to bed. But apparently I threw a fit and my dad finally said, I'll let him watch it. It'll scare the hell out of him. Problem solved. No more of this crap. And it backfired because I watched it and I loved it. I did get scared, but I loved it. And the rest is history. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's well, it's it, for, for horror movie lovers. Um, have you seen American movie, the documentary? Yeah. My brother gave it to me for Christmas about 10 years ago. Yeah. I think about that when you talk about like, I thought that was brilliant. That yeah. I love the film. Um, it's a, it's a great documentary just about these two people, but when I finished it, I emailed my brother. I was like, yeah, thanks for the movie. I just watched it. And I was like, oh, I hope I'm not like that guy. Because <laughs> he was like, he was like the, he was like the king of walking right up to the door that would lead to success and then not opening it. I was, I was just so frustrated for the guy. I was like, dude, you're at a conference with all these movie people. Talk to some people. That is too funny. Yeah, I love that film. Well, yeah, I, and he I, made, I love he made the film. He made the film. That's so cool. Just the fact that he did it, you know, it's, it doesn't even really matter if it's good or not. It's just he yeah. did it. He did the yeah. work. And, yeah, it's amazing. Too funny. Well, um, I'm actually I'm not going to keep you much longer. I want to ask you one more thing. Okay. Um, does your work, when you, any type of your artistic endeavors, when you endeavor in them does it energize you or does it drain you or do certain or is it a different for each one yeah it's a little different for for each one the writing is very energy like the fiction writing is very energizing when i'm doing it because i love the process i get really involved it's like it encompasses every kind of problem solving that i like and it's really abstract which makes it very hard to explain to other people <laughs> Because you're like, well, I'm trying to figure out this plot problem. And, uh, you know, it's kind of logistics and stuff. And they're just like, these people aren't real, right? <laughs> I'm like, well, uh, to me, they are, especially when I'm working on the book. So, <laughs> but trying to explain that to somebody, it's just like, oh, never mind. <laughs> but it's a, it's a weird life, weird, weird vocation. But um, and do you grateful. have any other outlets that you besides artistic outlets do you have anything else that you do for like your zen moments mm, well, i do i do meditate um mm. the 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 uh the creative stuff has a meditative aspect too for me it just kind of depends on where the work is going like if i'm working on a song and it's a really high energy song then i'm not going to be chill <laughs> but if i'm Working on a story, even if it's a, a part of the story that where there's a lot of action going on, it's it's pretty relaxing because it's, you know, you sort of slow everything down, try to figure out how to describe it. So, yeah, it's, and it's really centering because when I get done with it, I, um, I just feel, okay, this is, I'm doing what I am supposed to be doing. I get that sense of satisfaction from just having worked on something, so. That's really, really awesome. Yeah. yeah, it absolutely is. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I, this is so fun. I had a really good time. It's I'm super so glad cool. I Thanks so much. I had a great time. Thank you.